And then, um, Maria, it is over to you in your own time. Okay, great. So thanks very much, Rob, for that introduction. Um, today, this is going to be a very brief presentation about a project that I implemented in one of my modules last year. Um, and I did this with a lot of practical support and technical support from Rob. So thanks a lot to Rob also. So as Rob said, the title is Increasing Student Agency, a case study in giving students access to a lecturer authoring tool. So to begin with, why do this? Well, firstly, um, I wanted to harness students' familiarity with the video. There's nothing remotely innovative about using video in the language learning classroom. But what I wanted to do was to try and incentivize students to move from being passive consumers of digital content to creative, um, active uh, users. And um, this is something that was at the heart of this project. I had previously been involved in a smartphone cinema project back as far as 2012, where DCU held Ireland's first smartphone uh, festival, smartphone film festival. But some of the student feedback was that there lacked a particular language focus in this task. So whilst I really enjoyed doing it, I wanted to try and improve on that. Um, also, teachers, lecturers love setting reflective tasks. Um, I think it's one of those things that we go to just to fill up portfolio space sometimes and students are less enthusiastic about said tasks. So I wanted to find the middle ground between these, these two camps and H5P allowed me to do so. Um, We'll talk, I'll talk about this in more detail, but there are some very unique affordances offered by H5P, both temporal and spatial. So essentially that means what I wanted to do was I wanted to find particular points um, in space and time in a student video, and I wanted them to reflect on what was happening at that particular moment. Um, just to say, I used this in, a, in Loop Reflect, which is Mahara supported. And what was great about this was that it was a one-stop shop. So for whilst I do like technology, I'm not that technically savvy. So it was great to have this all embedded in a very nice, neat, streamlined way with great technical support from Lisa Donaldson and from Rob also. Um, and just to note also, one of the other reasons why I wanted to do this was that I want, I'm really interested in students' digital skills. And this is aligned to competence 6.3 pertaining to digital um, content create, creation on the DigComp Edu framework. So just to give you a quick backdrop to the project, this was implemented last year in a first year core language module with 115 students from five different programs. So quite a large module. Uh, it was a, it's a year long module with three contact hours per week, one of which was held in the lab. Oh, to be back in the glory days of having access to a lab. Um, and just also, so as this is a first year student cohort, they're transitioning from summative assessment driven by the Leaving Cert to a more formative assess assessment style. And this is something that we need, we, we felt we needed to accompany them and to give them the skills to do this. Um, this is a task-based module. So um, there, it's based, there's different units in this module. Um, and at the end of each unit, they have to carry out a specific task. So in the uh, unit where we used H5P, the task, the assessment type was, they had to carry out an interview with a French native speaker about university life. Then they had to create a photo novel depicting their worst day so far as a third level student, um, create a written piece documenting their best day, day thus far as a student, and then a critical analysis of a visit to an informal learning space. So on campus, um, here we have a, a really unique peer-led informal space called the language culture space. Unfortunately, it's closed at the moment. So um, we try to get students to go there, interact with their peers. Um, and then with the H5P enhanced video, what was unique to this project was specifically 
the um, use of reflective hotspots embedded in the video. And as previously stated, H5P had been recently enabled on the Mahara supported loop. So this made things a lot easier from uh, a teacher's perspective. So this is just a snapshot of the digital uh, artifact. Um, so which is the H5P enabled video. So on the left hand side, this is a screenshot of the video. So students, so when they had to interview the French native speaker, for example, one of the questions, one of the reflection pieces was to reflect on something interesting that they, that happened in this experience of interview, interviewing a peer on campus. Um, and you can see there's three little points here at the bottom, three little dots, and they actually um, are three different reflection hotspots that are embedded in the video. So when you play the video, they just appear and you see the text. So in this little box, the student says, um, to be honest, I was really surprised by how well we got on. We laughed a lot and I felt quite at ease. It was easy for me to be myself and thus I gained in confidence. And on the right hand side, this is just an overview of the overall portfolio. So you have um, what's really nice is that the H5P enabled video, it is it projects very nicely into the portfolio itself. You have the graph, the photo novel on the right hand side, and then essentially two reflection pieces um, on the bottom left and on the top right. Um, just to talk you through very briefly about the process itself. So there was three stages involved. Firstly, students answered H5P questions embedded in a video cloned by the lecture. So basically I went and I found a video on YouTube that I felt that was uh, uh, related to the theme that we were studying in class that week. And I added myself some interactive content. So just to basically get them familiar with it and to compare and co contrast this form of uh, basically comprehension versus the more traditional form of getting students to understand videos. And the second stage was the students created H5P interactions themselves on a video cloned by students. So that just means they went and found the video themselves, but this time they came up with the questions and they asked these questions to their peers. And thirdly, students create, and this is the last final stage, students created H5P interactions embedded in the video created by students. So they created these interactive hotspots on their own created video. So that was a really nice um, culmination of the task where they, you know, and also they completely owned the digital artifact themselves. So I think that's basically all for me, Rob. So I'm going to hand over to you. I'm going to stop sharing now and I'll let you take over. Great. Thanks, Maria. Thank you very much. So as Maria said, um, this was her idea and, and a wonderful idea it was to get students involved in this way. Um, and I provided Maria with um, some, some technical assistance. Not that she needed a, a huge pile. She, she's not doing herself uh, a good service by, by saying she's, she's not technically savvy. Uh, but um, in, in addition to helping Maria with the technical aspect of the project, um, I also assisted her with the evaluation um, of the project. So at the end of the project, students were uh, issued a, an evaluation that we asked them to complete and um, we had about 81 respondents in total I think uh, which is a, a pretty good response rate considering the there was only 115 students in the class um, and the, the results were mixed uh, which was interesting so um, in terms of when we asked them did they like using H5P and did they like the activity? 58% uh, said they did and 42% said they didn't. However, when we asked them, did their digital skills improve? Over 80% said yes, their skills did improve. And about 20% um, commented that, 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 that it didn't or, or they had some other negative comment uh, relating to digital skills. So it seems to be that whether or not they, they, they liked it or not, their skills did seem to improve somewhat. Um, similarly, their analytical skills improved quite significantly, about 76% of students saying their analytical skills improved as a result of the activity. And uh, again, about uh, roughly 60, 40 saying it should uh, be used again in, in, in the module. So these survey findings really provided us with um, um, some good um, 
a good starting point to drill down a bit further as to why the students felt this way. So a focus group was organised afterwards. We had about seven students participate in the focus group and they were, there was quite a range of them from different backgrounds and, and cohorts in the focus group. And we, we teased out some of the survey results in, in a bit more detail and several themes emerged, one of which was around instructions and, and guidance. So even though they were provided instructions and guidance uh, with how to use H5P, um, some of them either A, didn't realize that those instructions were provided amongst all of their other uh, learning material, or B, because the instructions were provided in French, they had difficulty following the, the technical instructions. Um, and also the H5P interface is in English, so some of them felt a bit jarred around uh, following instructions in French for, for a tool that's, that's in English. Um, students' own predisposition towards technology seemed to be a factor in whether or not they enjoyed the activity. So those, that, those who admitted that they you know, are tech savvy naturally enjoyed it a bit more, and those students that are a bit more tech averse seemed, seemed not to, to enjoy it. Um, there was again uh, is, is some interesting um, opinions around digital skills development and should um, students be developing their digital skills as part of their modules and as part of their standard learning um, in higher education. And again, some students said yes, and they're aware of the fact that they need to be able to develop um, uh, digital skills in order to be ready for life after graduation, but some of them didn't believe that was it at all. So some of them, uh, there was one one remark from from a student in the focus group who said, "You know, I came here to learn French, not not to learn computers." Essentially, so some really interesting uh, opinions from students around the place of digital skills development. Um, again. There was mixed responses. Some of them felt it did help them with their French because they were able, because they were required to listen back to a video, because they were required to add interactions to their video using H5P. It forced them to think a bit more deeply about the language and think about their vocabulary and think about their grammar and so on. So it did impact on their on their level of language learning. And, and similarly, because they had to um, add interactions that required them to reflect on their usage of French and, and place it at certain points in the video it also impacted on their uh, reflective skills. So, so some really interesting findings overall. Um, and those are some excerpts that you can you can you can read in your in your own time. We'll circulate the slides afterwards so you can you can read them. But again, a lot of these experts tie back to uh, to some of the findings and to some of the, the, the comments from the from the focus group. So Really, Maria showed this this graphic earlier about the kind of the three aspects to the the, the project. You know, the students uh, answered H five P questions in, in an object that Maria created first, and then they went and they created their own video that they uh, copied from YouTube, uh, and then they created their own video from scratch, uh, an interview with a French speaker, and they embedded their interactions in it, and they embedded it in. UDL. So the students were using different tools and technologies. Um, they were obviously using YouTube to locate a video and, and, and add interactions to it. They were using their own devices to make their own videos. Um, and they were using the H5P community site to, to access the, the H5P interface. But at every step in the process, the, they were touching on Moodle in one way or another. Moodle was really the spine that ran through this project. In the first instance, Maria used the Moodle H5P plugin to create the first artifact. Students, after they created their own H5P interactive video, they all collaborated together and submitted their links to a Moodle database activity so they could all each visit each other's interactive videos and engage with them and, and learn from another and so on. Um, and then lastly, they when they created their final video, they um, embedded it in Mahara and they accessed Mahara through MNET, through Moodle networking. Um, and then they, when they had finished their portfolio, they submitted it back to Moodle for, for grading. And I think this really shows the great flexibility of Moodle in that no matter what your ecosystem of technologies is, a VLE that is open and flexible like Moodle can really touch um, almost everything that you use in your, in your toolbox.
What are the plans for the future? Well, obviously the, the, the results and the findings give us some, some, some good um, um, improvements around the, the instructions and the guidance that we provide to students. So going forward, we'll look at giving them instructions in English and not French and perhaps provide them with, with increased technical support and so on. Uh, provide them with FAQs and, and, and the ability to maybe drop in and ask questions of someone like me or, or, or some other person who's familiar with, with H5P. Uh, we're interested in introducing a focus on, on creativity and helping students uh, develop a sense of creativity to be more creative in the videos that they create. Um, and interestingly, we're, we're not running Moodle 3.9 in DCU at the moment, but um, I think we will be in, in the near future at some point. And obviously with Moodle 3.9, there is a fully integrated um, H5P um, interface uh, in core Moodle. And at the recent Moodle Moot UK and Ireland, Lance Rowe from Idaho State University gave a very interesting uh, workshop around the different ways you can give students access to H5P. And there, there's a link there that you can explore in your, in your own time. But Lance has a couple of suggestions there for giving students access to the H5P content bank in core Moodle. And uh, that might be something we might look at in the future and save the need for, for having to use the H5P community site. So there's there's definitely some 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 exciting uh, modifications and, and refinements that we can make and we're we're definitely interested in doing that. Um, so all I will say is simply thank you uh, and I'm sure Maria uh, uh, shares her thanks as well um, and I'm gonna pause the recording now and hand over to you Owen. Oh there so I'm talking about integrating Moodle and Microsoft Word, uh, and I have a number of plugins that operate or that provide this uh, facility. There's one for books, for the Moodle book facility, one for the uh, Atto import, the Atto editor, the Atto text editor, and one for the questions for the question bank in the in, in a course. So I'm going to start by giving a demonstration of the three different uh, plugins, just to sort of show them in action first and then see, you know, talk a little, little bit more about them. So here I am in my test course that uh, I am, uh, that I've prepared here. And if I just go into the uh, uh, page, go into a page, I'll just I'll actually go back here and go to the editing page and just drag a page over, so just go here and scroll down into the page content and drag a document into the page and it copies text and headings and pictures and so on into the uh, Moodle page and I just save and display and then I have my Word document converted into you know nar native HTML for the Moodle course. So that's for a single page. If I have a multi-page document, then I've grabbed a, a book or a textbook that one of our lecturers here in Tala has written, and I just grab the book and drag it over the uh, choose a file, the file upload facility, import it, and in a few minutes, this is, I think, 250 pages or so. So it's quite a large document that has to be converted. So it takes a, a, you know, a few seconds. And so you then get a, a document, a whole book. It's a, a, a Moodle book. And I can just jump around different chapters or you know, make you know, navigate through the document. And the whole book is converted into uh, HTML. And you know, images are imported tables imported and so on. So that's the second facility. And then the last one is the question bank. So I'm in the Moodle question bank with the import and export facilities. So if I select Microsoft Word and drag in a set of questions here, this is about a hundred questions developed by one of our lecturers here in Tala uh, and import that. Again, because it's quite large, it just takes a few minutes. And you end up with six, you know, 96 questions have been imported. Here's the list of questions here. And you can just continue. And you can see then here are the questions. Uh, I can just preview a question. 
just grab this one and preview it. So it's a multiple choice question where I have, you know, choose one of the five options to do it. So I can just close that preview. So that's the basic facility is to uh, uh, import. And that's what I've done is just imported the a small page, single page document, 200 page, 350 page textbook, and a, a large bunch of questions all written in Microsoft Word. And from a lecturer's perspective, the most con the most big benefit of it is that it's, I believe it's much more convenient to edit in Word than to edit in Moodle. Moodle has lots of text boxes. If you look at the question interface, for example, there's about 30 or 40 text boxes you're supposed to fill in to actually add one question. You can do all that inside in Word in one simple step, in one simple table, or reasonably uh, structured table. So you can maintain your master copy in Word and you can re you know, exchange that with your uh, colleagues or with other people. So it, it can be easily purpose, repurposed for web. You can create a PDF document from it, from directly from Word and so on. From a student point of view, uh, I think accessibility is the big benefit that native HTML is far superior to Word documents or PDF files for reading on a website. And this is particularly true for the smaller form factor mobile devices, phones and tablets and so on, because they more word and pdf files don't um they don't re they don't re uh, reorganize the text to fit on the screen you just have to make you have to scroll and uh, left and right and up and down and so on to see the text with the uh, with a native html you get a far superior experience and it's not just for kind of people with a uh, smaller device but people with uh, hearing or reading difficulties uh, you know vision impairments and so on can also get screen readers to read the native HTML much better than anything else. So they're main things. So there are the plugins and the real question from your perspective as lecturers would be, well, do I have the plugin installed on my Moodle site? So there's, quick, there's a quick and easy way to check for each of the different facilities, whether you can actually use it. So if you're in the Atto text editor, the main text editor for Moodle, you should see a little word icon in the, in the toolbar if you're in questions, if you're importing questions, you'll see Microsoft Word table as a, as a possible format to import from. And finally, if you're in a book resource, you've got uh, facilities import from Microsoft Word or export to Word or export to book or export to chapter. You can do all that from the, uh, mm -hmm. from the interface. So you can see fairly easily whether or not you have these plugins installed on your own Moodle website. If you don't have them installed, you need to get your local friendly Moodle administrator to do so. Uh, and you need some good arguments for uh, why you want them installed. So kind of some, some fellow down the pub recommending them is probably not enough. You need something, you know, thing you tell them if they're mature, reliable, been around a long time, they're you know, supported and so on. They're quite widely used now and they're kind of in the top 50 or so uh, most installed of the contributed plugins. And that's 50 out of, you know, 1500 uh, more or less. So, and they're finally, they're pre-approved by Moodle host, hosting vendors. So I know in Ireland, Innovation are a big vendor and a big hosting organization. So they're pre-approved. And I believe Catalyst as well, I'm not absolutely certain, but Catalyst who are another vendor with probably a bigger presence in the UK, they have, I think, pre-approved these plugins as well. So that just means that they're quicker to, and easier to get them installed. They don't do go, go through an expensive review process. So, Stepping back a little bit, there's all these plugins, they're, they're, they're used in different situations, but they're, you know, they have some common features. So they import tables, images, equations, even uh, Microsoft Word equations. They retain inline formatting, bold and color. Not all, like we don't, we don't retain fonts, for example, uh, but we do retain other things like bold and color and underline. And finally, we maintain headings. So any headings in a Word document are converted uh, and formatted as headings in the HTML. And in particular for the book and the question import, they require, it's not just an optional extra to have headings. You must use structured content and named styles like heading one, two, and three uh, for your content in, if you're importing it into book and question. And the reason for that is reasonably simple. So for a book, it splits uh, a long document into chapters based on the heading one style. So like you just, if you, if you don't have headings, then everything comes into one page. It's just like a page. So you do need these, you need to have your in word, you need to use structured content, which, uh, 
is something that looks like some, something like this. So if, if, if you're in Word, you can go into View and turn on the navigation pane. And then you will see on the left-hand side here, this is the navigation pane in Word where you can see all the headings and they're indented nicely. So chapter one is exploring data, section one B is sampling and subsection then types of data. So they're headings in Word and they use the, na the native heading styles in Word. And you can see in over here, and this is the, in draft mode, you can look at the style window, the style area window. Uh, and you can see then heading, you know, exploring data is a heading one, sampling is a heading two, and types of data is a heading level three. So they're the named styles in Word that you need to use in books. And you also need to use them in questions because the heading one style in Word is used as a category name in uh, when you import questions and the heading two style is used as a question name. So you need to keep your, uh, you need to use these styles, otherwise it won't recognize the questions. It won't recognize the tables containing the questions. So there you need these structured styles in, in your Word document. So you may not, some people are familiar with Word styles and using them in structuring and headings and so on, other people aren't. So what we've done is we've developed a, a couple of companion Word templates that assist you to provide a, a, kind of an, a, a kind of a scaffolded interface to make explicit the, uh, the, temp, the, the requirements, the headings and so on that you need to use in your Word document. So um, you don't need them if you're just doing um, you know, headings and you already know how to do headings, but if you're, if you're creating quiz questions, then it does certain structured tables in a certain format. So you do need to have, the, definitely need to have the plugin for the, the question one. For the plugin, it's handy, but for the book plugin, it's handy, but it doesn't absolutely, it isn't absolutely essential. The templates must be installed in your PC. So Word 365 doesn't work if you can't use these templates, but they are, you can install them safely because they're digitally signed by TU Dublin for security. So what it looks like, what a template looks like, it, it is kind of a ribbon. We use the ribbon in Word and for the book template, you've got styles like heading one, two, three, title and so on, lists of styles and table styles and so on. And for the question template, we have, you know, the different supported question types. So multiple choice, multiple answer, true, false, and so on. So all these, you can just click on these buttons and you know, it creates a new question or it creates a new question file and so on. So they're just the interface that we make explicit in Word to assist the, the content creation and maintenance process. So I'm gonna give a quick demonstration of creating a new question file and in creating a, a multiple choice question, not an essay question, and importing that into Moodle. So we kind of finish off with that more or less. So if I can just escape out of that and go to uh, Word and just... So here I am in the Word interface and I can say, I want a new question file. And it pops up and it kind of immediately asks you to save a file. So I'm gonna say, Moodle Munch 2, it saves the file and there's already a, a one default question in there. And so I'm gonna just answer it, insert a question. So you can see that the table structure here has a certain format and the first thing it says is over here on the right hand side is this is MC, so it's a multiple choice question. And here's the question stem part of the table. And I can add then a question answers, the possible answers. So I'm just going to put in the answers here. Let's see if I can manage that. So I filled it in from stuff I had earlier. So I've created answers to the question. And I save that file and back I go to uh, my Moodle page, import, select the question type, choose a file, upload from Moodle Munch. I hope it's here somewhere. Here's Moodle Munch 2. Import it. And it just imports one question and I can preview the question here. So there's my 
Uh, here's my question, submit. Yep, right answer. But you can see that the interface for adding questions is relatively straightforward. If I wanted to add a true false question, I just click on the button and it brings me down. It creates a new table, creates a new heading, heading level two. Uh, it says it's a true false question puts me into the text box to fit in the question stem. And then I just need to answer, you know, I need to say, decide, is this a, which is the correct answer, the true or the false one. So there's all these supported, default supported question types. Most of them are kind of default uh, question types in Moodle. All or nothing is a kind of a special case, multiple choice question that's not part of the standard default or standard Moodle, it's a, it's an, it's a plugin. But you can see at the top here, uh, that's the Moodle quiz interface and then in the, for Moodle books, you can uh, just use heading styles and bullet styles and so on. So that's the demonstration of the, how to use them in practice in Word. So the, the two integrate reasonably nicely between Moodle and Word or to kind of struck using Word in, in, a, in a structured and controlled way, you get, very, you get good results and quick, easy importing into Moodle. Just to kind of put it in a kind of a larger perspective, the, the digital competence framework that kind of around which the whole Moodle Munch is built. If you're looking at that framework for educators, then they, these plugins kind of hit three of the strands that are talked about. Digital resources, assessment and empowering learners. And kind of there's a ton of a bit more information, a bit more depth as to where, which of the actual strands and which of the competences specifically are addressed by these particular plugins. So there's you know, interesting ones in assessment and in sharing and creating and modifying resources and so on. So that's quite useful. And finally, just uh, there's a, if you don't if you have the plugins installed and if you don't, can't get your Moodle administrator to uh, install them, there is a kind of a plan B. I run a website called moodletoword.net and you can create your own account on that site and use it to create your own quiz questions uh, and expo export them from that site and import them into your own site as XML rather than Word. And you can also download the templates from this site and you can also view various videos on how to install the templates and how to, uh, how to use them, how to use them in practice and so on. So that's kind of, that's the it, that's it really. There's just uh, further information. You can download the plugins from the, the Moodle database of plugins, the contributed, contributed ones, there's the links and there's the, the address of the Moodle to Word website and what you can do on that website. And that's, that's really it. So it's kind of open for questions. I'm just gonna 